All right. Um, it's uh, 930, so I'll call the Green Mountain Care Board's meeting uh, of November 16th, 2022 uh, to order. We have a long day ahead today. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying the first beautiful snow that we've had this year. It's really lovely here in Montpelier. Um, today's meeting, we are going to have uh, the executive director's report. Uh, Sarah Kinsler, our director of health systems policy, is going to review the Vermont all-payer model extension. Then we're going to hear from the staff uh, relating to Gather Health, which has undergone a name change since we last met with them. Um, and then we will have uh, Vital and uh, a break. And then we'll have the Health Information Strategic Plan and Connectivity Criteria for 2023, um, presented by uh, Catherine O'Neill here from the board and Krista McClure from the Healthcare Reform Integration. She's a Healthcare Reform Integration Manager at AHS. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Barrett for the Executive, Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. So a reminder that there are several open public comments uh, open right now um, on our website. If you go under the public comment section, you will see all the details. Um, we have the HIT plan, which HIE plan, excuse me, which Chair Foster just mentioned. We have the One Care Vermont um, budget and certification. Um, and we also have the potential next model, which is of the all peer model, which has been ongoing for a long time. And any comments we receive regarding that uh, issue, we will share with the governor's office and AHS as they are leading the negotiations on the next model. I also want to announce some scheduling updates. So the next couple of weeks, we'll be meeting on Monday instead of Wednesday. And um, happy Thanksgiving to everyone for next week. And then a, an exciting announcement, the board is going on the road. We're going down to the Rutland community on December 5th, and we'll be conducting our board meeting in person in Rutland. So stay tuned for more details on that. We'll be sharing very shortly, and we're excited to um, get out in the community and hear from patients and providers and businesses and um, really excited to be in person for that time. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. And we'll take up the minutes from uh, November 9th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, is there any board discussion relating to the minutes? Hearing none, uh, those in favor of approval of the minutes of November 9th, 2022, please say aye. 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 Um, the minutes are approved. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over to our Director of Health Systems Policy, Ms. Sarah Kinsler for discussion of the Vermont all pair model extension. Ms. Kinsler. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me get, get projecting over here. One moment, please. Are folks able to um, see the document I've got up on the screen? All right, great. Um, all right, um, so for the record, as Chair Foster stated, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Health Systems Policy. Um, and I am here today to present the terms of the short-term extension that the Vermont signatories have negotiated with our federal partners uh, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, or CMMI. The extension agreement has been uh, um, negotiated but not signed, so the board will need to consider the extension contents, uh, hear public comment, and then make a vote on the extension agreement before it can be executed. Uh, as Susan mentioned, we're currently accepting public comment on this matter, uh, and I'll be back before the board on November 28th to report out on any comments we receive uh, and make a staff recommendation, and we also have a potential vote noticed for that day. Um, so before I jump in, uh, any questions about process? All right, hearing none, we'll get to it. Uh, so for a little bit of context, uh, the, the Vermont All Pair Model Agreement, or APM, was originally slated to operate from 2018 to 2022. Uh, it is signed by the governor, the secretary of human services, uh, and the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. 
Um, in light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the transition to a new federal administration in 2021, the AHS Director of Healthcare Reform, Ina Backus, and I came before you late last year with a proposal to uh, request a one-year extension of the current APM agreement so that we could allow for fuller stakeholder engagement and an additional year of data to inform a proposal for a subsequent model. Um, at that time, the board voted in favor and the chair with the governor uh, and the AHS secretary formally requested that one year extension in December of 2021. In response, our federal partners at CMMI offered Vermont uh, a one year extension plus an additional transition year uh, at Vermont's option. So CMMI has indicated that this two year extension uh, would uh, best fit with their timeline and could act as a bridge to a future model potentially. Um, so for the past six months or so, the Vermont signatories led by the agency have been negotiating with CMMI on what the actual contents of that extension would be uh, and to come to, to term, uh, terms, uh, come to agreement on terms, excuse me. Um, so uh, what is in that extension agreement? And I'll, I'll say for folks on the phone uh, and board members and anyone in the public following along, uh, I uh, do not have slides today that I'll be presenting. On the screen, I've got a summary uh, of the amended and restated agreement uh, that kind of describes the changes and goes through them in more detail. Um, we've posted that. We've also posted the amended and restated agreement itself. Uh, so those are both part of the meeting materials. And I'll just scroll through here and kind of walk us through the summary document. So um, again, led by the Scott administration, the state signatories negotiated the extension agreement. Um, if signed, this would extend the uh, model uh, for a year um, with CMMI being required to offer Vermont an additional transition year. Um, if Vermont's, Vermont accepts the option year, that would put the current agreement through 2024. Um, so what are the major themes? Um, there, are, there are a lot of technical updates included in this. Um, a big part of the uh, a big part of this is um, updating the agreement language, the legal language to accommodate the change in time period. Um, there are also changes to recognize that COVID has and likely will continue to impact Vermont's performance on the agreement targets and to appropriately allow CMS in Vermont um, to consider COVID and other factors that are outside of the state's control when we look at this uh, performance against the, the agreement targets that go over the lifetime of the agreement. Uh, and finally, there are some technical changes to the population health and quality measures uh, to reflect changes to national quality measure sets and specifications. Um, the table on the second page of this document, which I'll scroll down to now. Um, please let me know if there, um, if the kind of document projection is moving a little slowly, um, and I'll slow myself down. Um, this really outlines uh, the changes that were negotiated, uh, and I'll I'll kind of walk us through those. Um, so first. Um, there is a series of recitals added to the introductory language of the agreement um, that, that would be added uh, to describe the amendments. It's also a great summary of what's changed um, and a helpful place for um, folks to review if you're trying to follow along. Um, the agreement would be updated to reflect the new end date, so 2023, or in the event that we take uh, that second option year, uh, 2024. And that that impacts both, um, you know, the the term of the agreement specifically, but it also flows through to calculation methodologies related to the targets and other things like that. Um, we next we've added um, language uh, related to the waiver of scale enforcement to both explain why that was granted in 2021, uh, provide that context on why the targets were waived. Um, and in keeping with that waiver, uh, there would be no targets during the extension period, but Vermont would be re required to continue to measure and report on scale performance as we have since the start of the model. And I do just want to say all of the reporting um, that would potentially be done uh, during the extension period that we're contemplating would, would continue to be public and we'd continue to report those things publicly. Um, as I mentioned um, above, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that um, that the agreement considered the potential impacts of COVID um, on Vermont's healthcare system. So um, an exogenous factors clause would be added to the population health outcomes and quality of care section. A uh, bit of background here. Um, in the uh, original agreement, there was a clause in the statewide financial targets section, that's section nine. Um, we commonly refer to that just as total cost of care. Um, and that allowed the state to reflect that, uh, to request that exogenous factor. So factors outside of the state's control be considered in assessing the state's uh, performance against the model's financial targets and, um, and in determining any enforcement action 
uh, by CMMI. When the agreement was signed, we were thinking about natural disasters, uh, heavy flu seasons and things of that nature. Obviously, um, we've had a significant exogenous factor um, that I don't think any of us would have anticipated um, at that time. Um, so the negotiated extension agreement would allow for an identical process related to the state's performance against the statewide quality um, of care and health outcome measures um, that are included in the agreement. And it at specifically adds a mention um, of COVID-19 as one such factor, both for quality and health outcomes and for financial targets. So we're explicitly recognizing that COVID is an exogenous factor. Um, in addition, in Appendix 1, which provides the detailed specifications for all of those statewide measures, um, it, it waives enforcement for failure, for the state's failure to be kind of on track to meet the those agreement targets um, for performance years three and four, so 2020 and 2021. Next in section eight, which uh, outlines uh, the state and federal responsibilities um, related to administering the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, um, we would add clarifying language to reflect the process that the board uses to determine the total shared savings advance payment amount. Uh, and this is the dollars that go um, toward the blueprint for health um, payments to patient centered medical home practices, um, to the community health teams and to the SESH program. Um, this amount is proposed to CMS annually by GMCB in a letter that the board sends with its proposal on the uh, Medicare ACO benchmark, the uh, ACO program spending target. Um, next, in sections 11 and 12, the extension agreement would add requirements um, that CMMI collaborate with Vermont to inform future models uh, and would require CMMI to continue to work with Vermont to explore ways to, uh, to allow additional provider types to receive um, Medicare reimbursement for mental health and SUD treatment services um, to better align with the, type, with the provider types that Medicaid uh, is are currently able to reimburse. Um, in addition, uh, the extension agreement would adjust some of the model reporting requirements during the extension period. So uh, adjusting the frequency of total cost of care reports from uh, from quarterly to semi-annual, um, just because we were seeing limited utility to the quarterly reports. Um, streamlining required content of the reports submitted in the extension period and updating the report deadlines to align with when we're actually able to produce them based on data availability. Um, and, and also like eliminating uh, future payer differential reports, AHS's report on integrating mental health, SUD, and home and community-based services with the model financial target services, uh, and requirements for Vermont to submit a proposal for a subsequent five-year model. Um, I, I do want to note that, again, in the event that we execute an extension, all of those all the reports that we do produce will continue to be public and posted. Um, so finally, uh, Appendix 1 would also uh, be modified to include technical revisions to the quality measure specifications. Um, those reflect changes to national measure sets, changes to reflect Vermont-specific reporting mechanisms, uh, and also to amend the approach to identifying whether measures are deemed to be on track um, toward the final kind of end of agreement target as well. Um, I, I do want to briefly note that there were some areas that Ina and I presented last year um, that we uh, requested in our additional proposal that CMMI was not able to accommodate during the extension period. Um, chief among those were payment model changes to the Medicare ACO program, uh, which was at the request of participating providers, and changes to how um, the, the Medicare contribution to Blueprint and SASH funds would flow. Um, so what happens if we agree to an extension? Um, with an extension, providers can continue to participate in the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, which is the Vermont modified version of the Medicare Next Gen ACO program. Um, through the extension, Vermont providers continue to have access to the potential for shared savings and shared risk with a payment model consistent with prior years of the APM agreement. Um, providers also would continue to have access to the Medicare uh, waivers that uh, that kind of come with participation in that program, including the telehealth waivers, home visiting waivers, and the three-day SNF uh, SNF rule waiver. Um, noting that uh, providers have been able to implement some of those more easily than others. Um, providers also uh, continue to be exempted from additional reporting requirements and quality-based payment adjustments associated with um, MIPS, Medicare's Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, um, because provider participating providers are considered to be participating in a Medicare Advanced Alternative uh, Payment Methodology. 
Um, in addition, Vermont continues to receive uh, Medicare funding for the blueprint payments to the primary care practices, CHTs, and SASH. That was about $9.1 million in 2022. Um, and finally, Vermont conti would continue to maintain a high level of contact with staff and leadership at CMMI, which we hope to use to advocate for, um, for future models that can um, benefit Vermonters and Vermont health care providers and that can really work for us as a state. Um, I do want to um, remind folks that uh, the results we have to date from, from the most rigorous analysis um, of the all pair model, which is the federal evaluation um, of the model, have been um, positive. Uh, the, initial, uh, the initial evaluation report from the independent evaluators at NORC uh, covered 2018 to 2019 and provide an early picture of implementation and impact. Um, and they did find positive early, impl excuse me, positive early indications uh, for the Medicare ACO program uh, and Vermont as a whole compared to other states, including savings for Medicare. Um, conversely, without an extension, Vermont providers rejoin Medicare fee-for-service uh, unless they're able to uh, enter a different uh, Medicare advanced alternative payment methodology. They would be subject to MIPS and its quality-related payment adjustments unless they would otherwise be exempted, uh, and they would lose access to um, those waivers associated with the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. Um, Vermont would also lose that nine-plus nine million dollar contribution to the blueprint PCMH, CHT, and SASH payments uh, and would no longer have kind of the same level of access and relationship with CMMI. Um, so uh, in, in closing to my uh, remarks, um, I will say Secretary Samuelson sent a memo to the board yesterday uh, stating their support uh, for the extension, and that letter has been posted to our website and, and included in the meeting materials. Um, I want to thank Secretary Samuelson and Director of Healthcare Reform, Ina Backus, for their partnership in this and for helping the board understand where um, the co-signatories uh, stand in position to this. Um, and as I mentioned, we're currently accepting public comment on this matter, so I'll be presenting uh, any any comment we receive and a staff recommendation to the board uh, on November 28th prior, prior to a noticed potential vote on this topic. I'll hand it back to you, Chair Foster. Great. Thank you very much. That was uh, extremely informative. <clears throat> Um, I see on our agenda that our general counsel is listed. Is, is Mr. Barber also presenting on this topic today? Not presenting. I'm just here to uh, answer questions if there are any. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Um, uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it to any board questions or comment, and um, we'll start with Ms. Lunge. Thank you, Sarah. That was a wonderful summary. I really appreciate all your work on this. Um, I don't actually have any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Walsh, do you have any questions or comments? Sure. Good morning, Chair, and thank you. Good morning, Sarah. Um, uh, great job summarizing what has been, um, I'm sure, a, a lot of work, a, a lot of conversations, a lot of hard thinking. Um, I appreciate the summary. I have one question. Um, I'm wondering, um, it seems often conflated, but the all-payer federal agreement and the ACO that we have in the state. And um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that relationship and what's the core function for an ACO in this agreement? Thanks for that question, um, Member Walsh. Um, I'll try to answer it in parts, and I'll look to uh, I'll look to Mike to jump in if he would like to. Um, so I I do want to stress, and I think this is great context and something I probably should have mentioned at the beginning of um, of my remarks. Um, when we talk about the extension agreement, when we talk about the all-peer model agreement, we're talking about the contractual relationship between the state of Vermont uh, and CMMI that allows us to kind of have this um, slightly special relationship, slightly special model um, for Vermont. Um, no ACO is a party to that uh, contractor relationship. Um, it, But it allows Vermont uh, and CMMI to offer and ACO or ACOs who would want to participate, a slightly Vermont-tailored uh, ACO model um, for, for our state. Um, as you know, we have 
one ACO currently participating in the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. Um, that is a relationship really between uh, that ACO and CMMI. There is a participation agreement that governs that relationship. So the, the ACO federal contractual relationship, um, it is CMMI that um, that deems, um, you know, whether an ACO possesses the core competencies to participate in that model and those requirements are laid out in that participation agreement, which again, the state is not a party to. So two separate contractual relationships. Mike, do you have anything to add there? Uh, no. Well, thank you for that background and context. That's very helpful. Um, I guess the, the, the second part, um, I'm just digesting that information. But the, the second part is um, in our agreement, what's the, the core function of the the of the ACO in our agreement, of an ACO um, in this agreement? What's what are they what's the key thing that they are supposed to be able to um, help the state do to fulfill its contractual responsibilities with the federal government? I'm like unmute, so I want to let him answer first. Um, I would say that the, the core function is to take responsibility for the cost, quality, and overall care of the populations that they're contractually responsible for caring for. Um, the all-payer agreement doesn't really get into the details about you know, core functions of an ACO like uh, care coordination and, you know, data and stuff like that, that is um, typically covered in the payer agreements. And um, okay. like Sarah mentioned, uh, I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add on to that. My only addition would be the, the kind of part of the agreement that most closely relates to this is the part that describes the state and federal um, responsibilities in administering the, Med the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. So, um, you know, in, in, under the agreement is the state's responsibility to um, kind of support Medicare in offering this um, this Vermont specific uh, ACO model. And and I would say that's kind of where the the all pair model agreement leaves it. Okay. Um, thank you both very much. Um, I've uh, professionally um, worked with uh, more than a handful of ACOs, but um, not in Vermont. And so this context, the state specific context um, is really helpful to my thinking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holmes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, I don't have any questions, um, but Sarah and Mike and the others on the team, I just really want to, you know, note my appreciation for the hard work that you did over the several months um, related to these negotiations and the planning for the negotiations. So thank you. No questions. Great. Um, and Dr. Berman, is, do you have any questions or comments? Additionally, no questions, but and, and additional appreciation for all the hard work that everybody has done through this process and advocating for Vermonters um, through the process. So thank you so much. Great. Um, and I participated in some of these negotiations and work, so I got to see firsthand the effort that this took. And I'll express my appreciation for the uh, Secretary, Jenny Samuelson, and Director, Ms. Bacchus, for their efforts and collaboration with us on this and our staff's great work. And I have no questions. Um, with that, I'll turn it over uh, to the healthcare advocate if they have any questions or comments. Thanks, Chair Foster. No, nothing from us, just appreciation for Sarah and the team. And happy winter winter days to everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to public comment. Uh, please, uh, as usual, use the hand function, and I'll call uh, in the order in which I see them raised. Um, the first one is Ms. Aronoff, Ms. Susan Aronoff. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Aronoff, sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, good morning. Nice to see everyone. Um, first of all, Sarah, 
Thank you so much for all this work. And as you can probably anticipate, the change I am most thankful for is that Medicaid funded home and community based services, the other side of the Medicaid house, seems to no longer be in the crosshairs. So this is, I guess, I don't know if I can ask questions. I just want to really confirm that, but I can read. It seems like it's really off the table. My real comment, and this is really goes to the new members, but I'd ask the ones who've been there before to just think about it. Just as some feedback, I do policy work for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I'm a state employee. I'm housed in the Agency of Human Services um, Secretary's Office as an affiliated council. All 50 states have a Developmental Disabilities Council. We're entirely federally funded. We exist to really to bring the voice of people with disabilities and their family members into all these important policy discussions. In order to get the federal money that pays my salary, for which I'm very grateful, Vermont has to sign a set of assurances, Jenny Samuel since signed the most recent ones, that guarantee that the Developmental Disability Council A gets to advocate whatever policy positions we want, whether they align with or depart from the AHS. So that's first and foremost, just wanna give, I always try to lay that out for people when they see my email, vermont.gov, I work in AHS, why do I get to sit here and question the wisdom of um, Jenny Samuelson or Ina Backus or anyone else? It's because of these special assurances and this special unique role we have A little bit of my own personal background, as Sarah and other folks know, I worked on the healthcare transformation grant that kind of gave birth to the all payer model agreement. I'm very familiar with it and with how it's operated. One of the things that really undermines people like me, like our faith in it, is that the Green Mountain Care Board is a party. You're a party. You guys sign it as a party. Under the agreement, you guys have responsibilities as a party. The chair has to submit an annual letter saying that he's working with the ACOs to achieve scale targets. Throughout the agreement, even the new agreement, wherever it says the state, the state shall do this, the state shall do that, it's not just the Agency of Human Services and the governor, which is an appropriate role for them. It's also the Green Mountain Care Board, the regulator, so you, you guys probably know it's not a new question. Are you a promoter? Are you a regulator? Are you a reformer? Are you a regulator? In my personal experience, we can just take the issue like administrative expense. Originally, one care was gonna have to show that in its budget, their administrative expense, um, that the benefit the state got every year, either through savings or improvements of quality, outweigh their administrative expense. But the board in its wisdom did what I call literally move the goalposts and said, no, no, we could never just functionally calculate in any given year what the administrative expense was after the fact to what the savings were. It just was like a mathematical puzzle that just couldn't really be worked out. So as you guys know, because you discussed last week, now that administrative expense is gonna be matched up against cost deferments or other vague things at the end of the project with this extension. It's not clear when that reconciliation is ever gonna take place. So the board as a regulator might think moving a goalpost or changing a target or changing uh, something in the budget order is a smart thing to do. But when the board is also a party and when the board, when I've sat through meetings after meetings, hospital budgets, meetings, hearings, where the board convinces, cajoles, coaxes, encourages, changes policies to really incentivize hospitals to have every possible program in the ACO, just all along the way, done everything it can to promote this all pair model, success of the all pair model agreement, because you guys are a party to it, people like me lose, have lost faith, a lot of faith along the way. 
Are you doing this because this is what's good for Vermonters, what will keep down costs, et cetera? Or are you doing this because it's what's good for this agreement, what's good for the ACO, what's good for UVM healthcare? So I would just encourage you amongst yourselves and with Michael's wise counsel and other attorneys amongst you to consider why you think you need to be a party to this agreement. Most other states that have agreements with Medicare, they don't have an entity like the Green Mountain Care Board. I did a lot of research way back when to see if the Green Mountain Care Board as an entity could even enter into such contracts. But as you all know, lawyers and others amongst you familiar with administrative law probably know that the Green Mountain Care Board is just this empty vessel <laughs> and the legislature breathed life into it. And the legislature, I'll say, gave you guys a bum deal. They told you to develop regulations that balance support for innovation um, with oversight. They also put you in tandem with the, with the agency of administration, with the governor, to negotiate with CMS for an all-payer model agreement. And honestly, to this day, I just don't get it because I think it has really undermined your legitimacy as a regulatory body. And when you have the kind of monopoly or close to it system that we have in the state, you need a strong independent regulator with credibility whose, you know, chair doesn't go and become the, you know, next big earner at UVM. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why those of us out here don't have a lot of faith or respect for certain parts of this process. But one of them really is there just isn't the kind of regulatory objectivity or distance for a project of this undertaking. Uh, there hasn't been to date. It seems like maybe there's a, a sea change. So I would just implore you to reconsider the question of do you need to be a party and if so, why? And if you're going to be a party, how can you mitigate against the appearances of uh, conflicts of interest and conflicts of roles? Some of you may or may not be aware, about five years ago, the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules had a little conversation with Chair Mullen when he was the new chair, saying, hey, Mr. Chair, we're a little concerned about this apparent EB-5 conflict. They use the language EB-5, that's why I'm using it, uh, conflict between uh, promoting and regulating. And the chair then uh, you know, was kind of open to having the conversation none of the committees of jurisdiction at the legislature have ever taken up that issue. But to my knowledge, publicly, Green Mountain Care Board has never taken up that issue. If you guys could take that issue up offline, so to speak, I think it would be really beneficial to the system overall to get some clarification of your role. Promoter, regulator, reformer, all of the above. We really, in our world, we are really looking for a strong regulator. Thanks. That's my comment. And I'll be putting some of the stuff in writing. And again, Sarah, so I'm trying to learn to do the compliment sandwich, you guys. And really excellent, excellent work on the redraft and the elimination of the home and community-based services being in the total cost of care, all that kind of stuff. Super tremendous. And um, just really, you guys have so many balls in there and you're coming out of COVID and um, kudos to everything you're doing. Thanks. Ms. Arnoff, thank you very much for those important points and for raising those. Um, and thanks for your close participation and your work at the Developmental Disability Council. I'm glad you raised your hand and raised those. And there are certainly issues that we uh, think about and that are important to Vermonters and to us, of course. So thank you for, for doing all that. Um, and um, uh, I don't see any other hands raised at this point. Um, and so with that, we will turn on to our next subject, which is uh, the staff presentation on Gather Health. And I'm forgetting their new name, but I'm sure uh, our staff will, will remind me. And uh, our Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, Marissa Melamed, um, will take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members of the board. I'm actually going to turn it right over to uh, Senior Health Policy Analyst Julia Bowles to walk you through the slides. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, can people hear me and see the slides? Wonderful. Thumbs up. Thank you. Um, 
Great. So like Marissa said, my name is Julia Bowles. I'm a senior health policy analyst, um, and I'm joined today by Marissa Melamed and also Russ McCracken, who will be available if there's any questions. Um, and yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, the new name is Lore Health, uh, formerly Gather Health, um, which is who we're here to um, revisit today. So in terms of the agenda for this presentation, we will briefly review the scope of this review, as well as some new information that we've received from the ACO, um, provide a summary of the recommendations, and then we will have time for board questions and discussion, public comment, and then the potential vote. So this slide should look very familiar to people at this point, but we wanted to bring it up again um, just to remind people of the scope of this review um, in that we are looking at a Medicare only ACO with fewer than 10,000 lives, which is highlighted um, on the right hand side of the screen. So it's important to remember that this is a very different process from the One Care Vermont process that kicked off last week, um, which is reflected on the left hand side of this crazy flow chart. Um, so some of the main differences between today's ACO and One Cares review is first that Lower Health is a Medicare only ACO, meaning that they're not subject to certification. Second, due to the ACO having fewer than 10,000 lives, the review is guided by a different section of Vermont statute. Um, third, the GMCB is in a different regulatory posture relative to LOR, and this is because LOR, it, LOR Health is participating in a standard Medicare program called the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which has many preset terms that are all established under federal rules. Um, and additionally, LOR is a multi-state ACO, so the board is balancing its review of the ACO with the jurisdictional limits of regulating their operations specific to Vermont. So this next slide is just sort of a summary of everything that I just went over um, for reference. And moving on, we just have two short slides reviewing information that we have received since we last presented on this topic on November 2nd. The first, um, as Chair Foster mentioned, is that we heard from the ACO about their name change. So um, formerly Gather Health, ACO LLC, the legal entity, submitted a legal name change due to another entity using and trademarking Gather Health shortly after their initial use. And their legal entity is now named Lower Health ACO LLC, which I will refer to as Lower or Lower Health as we move through this presentation. Um, so GMCB staff will work on updating the website materials to reflect this change, but the prior submissions that we received with their budget will still have the name Gather Health. Um, the second part of the new information is that the GMCB received information from Lower Health providing further details about their corporate structure and confirmation of what they shared during the hearing that they will not sell or share beneficiary data. Finally, um, as it relates to new information, we have not received any written public comment about Lower Health's FY23 budget. So with that, um, I will move on to the summary of the recommendations. Uh, in the following slides, anything in red text is going to denote something that has changed since we last presented these recommendations on November 2nd. There's also key points below each recommendation, which are also from the past slides um, that the staff presented on November 2nd, and they have a snapshot of the evidence supporting the staff's recommendations. So I will go through all five recommendations and then come to a slide that summarizes them so we can see everything together. So the first recommendation is that lower health provides to GMCB its shared savings or losses segmented for Vermont. The second recommendation is lower health provides an updated version of their Vermont financial summary with actuals, including a breakout for in-kind incentive spending and that GMCB staff are to develop the template and set the deadline. The third recommendation is for Lower Health to provide to GMCB its quality reporting segmented for Vermont if possible with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality. The fourth recommendation has a lot of red, um, so I will <laughs> do this one a little bit slower. I know it's also smaller font. 
Um, but the red reflects additions that were made in response to feedback that board members gave at the November 2nd meeting. So the recommendation reads, um, Lower Health provides a copy of the terms and conditions given to beneficiaries upon signing up for the Lower Health platform, as well as any other marketing or informational materials shared with beneficiaries. So moving to the sub-bullet, Lower Health shall notify the GMCB immediately if the intended use of beneficiary data changes from what Lower Health presented to the GMCB in connection with the review of Lower Health's FY23 budget. There's some text that's um, had strike through on it, which is just taking out the old date reference. And continuing in red, um, if no changes are reported to GMCB, Lower Health shall provide a certification under oath with the submission of its FY24 budget that no changes have been made to Lower Health's intended use of beneficiary data. Um, and when we get to the summary slide, this one will be nicer to look at. Um, so I'll keep going. <laughs> Um, the fifth and final recommendation is that Lower Health provide the biannual update with the first report submitted with their FY24 budget submission on October 1st, 2023, about how Lower Health's care model is working in Vermont, including the number of Vermont attributed patients registered to the Lower Health platform and any unique Vermont challenges. And the development of this template report is delegated to GMCB staff. So this slide has a summary of the recommendations, which I will plan to leave up on the screen as we move into board questions or comments. Um, but I also just wanted to show that we have suggested motion language on the next slide, which I can return to when the board's ready for that. Um, but for now, I will pass it to you, Mr. Chair, and um, go back to the summary slide for your reference. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it okay. over to... Uh, board questions or comment um, in the same order we uh, went through the all-payer model extension. I'm sorry, I'm Ms. Focused. It looks like you're, Robin, are you speaking? Got it, no questions, all right. <laughs> Uh, Tom Walsh, do you have any questions or comments? No, no questions, no comments. Thank you, Julia, for the uh, for the summary. Great. I don't either. Thank you for the clear presentation, the updated recommendations, and I have no uh, further questions or comments. Uh, same for me. No questions or comments at this time. And thanks for all this. I don't either. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. Nothing else from us. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to air our concerns and the opportunity to work with Marissa, Julia, and the team. And we support the recommendations before you. Back to you, Chair Proctor. Thank you. Uh, and I'll turn it to uh, public comment again using the raise your hand function. Um, seeing none, and, and based on the concise and clear recommendations, um, uh, is there a, a motion? I'm happy to make a motion. Um, I move that the Green Mountain Care Board approve Lower Health ACO's fiscal year 23 budget as submitted to the board, subject to the conditions reviewed by the board today. I'll second. Hopefully you can hear me now. Great. Um, so Jessica moved and uh, Robin uh, seconded. Uh, is there any board discussion of the motion or any um, members wish to comment on the motion? Hearing none, is there any public comment uh, or HCA comment on the motion language? All right, hearing that. Um, uh, all those in favor of moving uh, that the Green Mountain Care Board approve Lower Health ACO's fiscal year 23 budget as submitted to the board subject to the conditions reviewed by the board today. Uh, please say aye if you're in favor. Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, the vote is unanimous and the motion carries.
Thank you very much, Ms. Bowles and Ms. Melamed for your work on this. And uh, Mr. McCracken. And for the first time, I think in my uh, 10 years chair, we are ahead of schedule by a healthy margin, which makes me happy. Um, uh, next, we have a presentation by Vermont Information Technology Leaders and Vermont Health Information Exchange uh, Overview. And that will be provided by Ms. Maureen Gilbert, who is the Director of Client Engagement at Vermont Health and sorry, Vermont Information Technology Leaders, commonly known as known as Vital, and Ms. Beth Anderson, who is the President and CEO of Vital. And I see that they're both here and, and ready. So thank you guys for um, attending and being here. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to talk to you today. Um, what we're doing um, today, you all have seen the agenda, but we're going to do a bit of an overview of the HIE. Particularly, it's been a while since we've done it. Caps the new members up about what we do. Um, and then later in the agenda, we will give you our quarterly update so we can talk in a little more detail about the work we've been doing since the last time we talked with you. Um, I'm here, uh, as you mentioned, with Maureen Gil Gilbert, who is our Director of Client Engagement, and also um, Christina Choquette will be part of this conversation, and she's our Director of Operations. I just wanted to take a minute to um, you know, start off and tell you about the conversation. Um, should we display the slides? I don't know if we coordinated that up front. I can go ahead and share my screen. So, great, I don't know if we can do that. Thank you. Um, so just as you mentioned, um, Vital Vermont Information Technology Leaders, we are the designated operator of the Vermont HIE, and that um, has been a, a case for a while, um, designated in the HIE plan to be the operator. We are an independent nonprofit, we're a 501c3, we're based in Vermont, we have about 27 staff members. Um, we are governed by a board of directors who represent um, across the healthcare and business ecosystem in Vermont, we represent hospitals, healthcare providers, health technologists, payers, and um, independent businesses across Vermont to guide the organization. Um, next slide, please. Our mission is to securely aggregate, standardize, and share the data needed to improve the effectiveness of healthcare for Vermonters. As you, we walk through the slides today, we'll, we'll talk a lot about the work we do to make sure that the data really is um, standardized, um, aggregated maps to individual records so we can have one individual patient record really help to inform care um, and the work that goes into that to really make the data usable and, and meaningful for providers and other purposes that we have. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Maureen to talk through some of what Thanks, we do. Beth. So we're going to start right at the beginning today with um, what is health information exchange. And I'm going to rely here on um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technologies definitions. So health information exchange, you can use it as a verb, the exchange um, of health information, appropriate and confidential sharing of clinical information among authorized organizations. Or you can use it as a noun, so an organization that has agreed upon operational and business rules that um, enable electronic sh sharing and secure exchange of health-related information. And that's what, what the Vermont Health Information Exchange is. That's what VITAL is. We operate the, the noun of health information exchange. And we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of health information exchange. And I'm going to go right to the next slide to talk about um, benefits sort of stakeholder by stakeholder. And we always start here with patients. So. For patients, one of the goals is that they don't have to carry their records with them from provider to provider. They don't have to make these record requests. There's less burden on the patients. Um, there's also the benefit of better care at their providers because they've got more complete information to work with. For providers and provider organizations, and um, we, we work every day with providers who are participants, we see that they have access to more complete patient records that can support care delivery, inform care coordination, and reduce duplicate tests. 
It's also about efficiency. So this is about getting data from other providers accessible in their electronic health records and, and not by fax. It's amazing how much faxing is still help, happening in the healthcare system today. And we're really working to try and reduce that and get data flowing electronically. We also serve as a hub for efficient data sharing. So without VITAL, without the Vermont Health Information Exchange, there would be much more requirement of point-to-point -point connections between healthcare providers and between healthcare providers and for instance, um, health reform initiatives or the state. Um, we serve as a hub to reduce that, that um, duplication of connections. We're also a source of patient data during planned or unplanned system downtime. And we've seen that a couple of times in the last few years um, where health systems or organizations have had unexpected downtime and they've relied on patient data in the Vermont Health Information Exchange to continue providing informed care. There's several other stakeholders that are, are important and um, that, that, that use our data in their day-to-day -day work. I'm going to start with public and private payers. For them, access to data can support operations like case management, um, prior authorization, and potentially quality measurement. And, and we are seeing that um, happening today, particularly the case management work. For public health, um, the Vermont Department of Health, access to patient information supports case investigations and supports public health programs. And it also provides the opportunity to aggregate immunization and laboratory data. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that because it's, it's something that we've been working on a lot lately in a way we've supported public health recently. And then um, data is also used for population health purposes. So to support operations and measurement of health reform and population health initiatives. So I'm going to turn it over to Christina Choquette, our Director of Operations, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how we do what we do. Hi. So I'll just start with um, kind of repeating what some of what's been said before and maybe dig in a little bit more. So the the power of the VHI is is collecting the data real time. And, and not having to collect data that's weeks or months old. And then once we get that data, being able to actually aggregate it, match it across the state, and then standardizing that data for several purposes, um, some of which Maureen has already walked through. And again, serving as a hub so that you get the data one time and you can use it for many purposes so that we can share the data uh, providers can access the data and it eliminates that need of having to create point to points. If we have the data, we can, we can use that data several times for several purposes. At the same time, protecting that data and honoring uh, patient consent as well as um, uh, having security practices in place and policies that we follow. Um, we take the privacy of the patient's data very seriously. And then when we are able to share that data, using it for the many purposes that Maureen walked through, supporting patient care, helping with quality improvement programs, um, and those types of activities, as well as case management, um, having uh, providers and users of the data access it in order to better care for their patients. Next slide, please. So after we do all of that collecting and aggregating and matching, we do have that one longitudinal record for Vermonters that can provide meaningful and usable data to those who need it. So we don't simply just take the data and move it all around. They're behind the scenes, we, we do extensive work in order to do all of that matching and standardizing of the data. Understanding the data that we are getting, making sure that it's put into code sets that can be understood by uh, electronic health records or other types of analytic systems. Those systems are expensive. We want to make sure that the um, the organizations that purchase those systems actually can leverage that data. Plus, we also need to make sure that it's translated into ways that 
providers can actually read the data. It needs to be human readable. And so we do that work as well as working with those data organizations that are actually providing the data to make sure that we're getting it in a way that it can be used. Again, we, we apply the patient consent and honor that, and it's, um, it's done so that we can protect the data and share it appropriately. You'll hear about this a bit more later, the connectivity criteria that we use First of all, to establish whether or not a data contributor is able to make a connection. So we're using the money wisely in making those connections and working with vendors and healthcare organizations, again, who are spending money on their EHRs um, to make a connection that can send the data that we know that we can actually uh, match across the organization and work with them if there are some, some issues with their data. We do have a best in breed uh, patient matching system, and that has enabled us to have a matching of greater than 96% across the VHI. We also use, um, uh, we also work with organizations to understand if they are sending a local code to be able to map that to a standard uh, code set. You might be familiar with SNOMED and LOINC. We're able to do that. So again, the, uh, the, the data is meaningful and usable, whether it's human readable or for another system that likes codes and numbers. And we do that using terminology services. Once we know what those mappings are to translate the messages that are coming in the door um, for storage and then usage. We also maintain the original code and code set that is supplied to us. So we never lose the integrity of that initial data. And then we store that data in a FHIR data structure. Our uh, platform was implemented in order to support that FHIR framework, which FHIR is Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. It uses some techie speak, uh, JSON objects, so that systems, especially EHRs, um, it's it's a framework and a standard that can be used to share data um, transactionally. So that's it, and I think Maureen, you're you're next. I am. Thank Thanks, you. Christina. Sure, thanks. So the next question folks usually have when they're learning about the Vermont Health Information Exchange is who's contributing data? What data is available through the Vermont Health Information Exchange? And over the, the years, we've built connections to most of the large healthcare providers in Vermont and many of the smaller ones as well. So all of the Vermont hospitals are contributing data, as is Dartmouth Health. And when I say the hospitals, I'm also... Um, grouping in there, their inpatient and ambulatory services, their emergency departments, their specialty and primary care um, practices. All of the Vermont federally qualified health centers are contributing data. We also have 32 independent specialty and primary care practices sending data into the Vermont Health Information Exchange, about twice that um, use data through, from the Vermont Health Information Exchange, and we'll talk more about data use later. There's six home health agencies 12 pharmacy chains and in individual pharmacies. That doesn't sound like a lot until you think about all of the kidney drugs in the in Vermont, all of the CVS locations in Vermont, um, many of which came on during the pandemic in order to contribute immunization data. 17 labs, state and commercial, again, that includes um, chains with multiple locations and one state agency. And the way data contribution is funded is through um, the state contract, new and replacement connections, we call them interfaces, are, are funded that way. And these connections are prioritized with the Health Information Exchange um, Steering Committee's Connectivity Criteria Subcommittee. And we'll, again, as Christina said, we'll talk more about the connectivity criteria um, later in the day. And it defines some tiered requirements for data contribution. So tier one, you know, you can get connected. You can tell, tell the Vermont Health Information Exchange who the patient is. Tier two, you're sending a lot more of that essential patient information, A1Cs, um, blood pressures, and so forth.
So what data do we have? Um, data comes in, I think, when I first walked in the door at, at Vital, I just assumed you kind of hooked up a, a pipe to the electronic health record and it just all came through. Uh, it's a little different than that, comes through in some specific feeds, some specific data types. So the ones that we get currently are admission, discharge, and transfer messages, ADTs. This says a patient was seen in the emergency room. A patient was admitted to the inpatient unit. A patient was discharged from the hospital. It's where is the patient? Um, where are they receiving care? We also receive laboratory results, radiology reports. So we don't have the imaging, but we do have the radiologist's reading of the images. Um, transcribed reports, and this is many types of notes, doctor's notes, nurse's notes, discharge summaries, quite a variety. Immunization messages um, just carries information about a, an immunization, about a vaccination. We get some home health data. And then continuity of care documents. And continuity of care documents are these um, point in time snapshots of a patient's medical record. This is the closest thing to what I was saying I was envisioning when I walked in the whole medical record. But it is a point in time snapshot. Um, this contains information like patient history, medications, allergies, procedures, um, much more than that. I won't go through the whole list right now. But one of the things that Vital is great at and known for among HIEs is the ability to extract data from um, these continuity of care documents and store it in a way that's, that's searchable. So how is this data accessed? Um, there are 150 organizations that are currently using Vitals data access services. So really providing benefit for a large number of healthcare providers in Vermont. And that data is made available um, through the Vital Access Clinical Portal. This is the one that's sort of easiest to actually envision. It looks like an EHR. It's accessible through a web browser. A provider or a staff member um, who is authorized can go in. They can look up one patient and see their longitudinal health record in this portal. We also work to deliver data into electronic health records. And this is really long term. This is the big goal that you get more of the data from the Vermont Health Information Exchange into the place that the providers are working every day so they don't have to toggle between systems. Right now, that's laboratory results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports. So this is one of the, way we, one of the ways we are working to eliminate faxing is many um, lab results in the state are delivered into electronic health records by VITAL. Um, also under development, uh, APIs, this is application programming interfaces, um, and Smart on Fire, this is a, a strategy for delivering more data types directly into EHRs and to any EHR apps. So we're actively exploring that right now. Event notification is another data access tool. Um, this is something we do through third party, a third party partner. And it's a way of, of getting notified when a list, somebody on a list of your patients, if you are a provider, um, has been seen in the emergency department or hospital. And then we also do custom reporting and analytics. So in addition to the data access, one of the real benefits for um, providers, uh, especially for data, this is for data contributors specifically, is the delivery of their data through the Vermont Health Information Exchange to a variety of stakeholders. So this is all about streamlining required data submission and reporting for providers, and ultimately informing public health and population health efforts. So this is the, instead of all the point-to-point -point connections, the provider organizations build one connection to VITAL, and then VITAL delivers data on to other clinicians and organizations that provide care. We deliver data to the Vermont Department of Health, to One Care Vermont, to the Blueprint, and then also to the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative for their care management work. So how data sharing is authorized, this is, this is essential. This is at the heart of what we do, um, is authorization of, of data sharing and, and really honoring um, patient consent preferences, um, operating in accordance with state and federal law. 
Um, so I'll start by saying that since March 2020, the Vermont Health Information Exchange has been an opt-out health information exchange. Um, the way we authorize sharing is through entering into data use agreements with contributing organizations that specify how the data may be used. And this is always in accordance with state and federal law, with HIPAA, and with the protocols to access to protected health information on the Vermont Health Information Exchange that's included in the Vermont Health Information Exchange strategic plan. So we're committed to educating the public about data sharing and their options, and ultimately to honoring people's decisions to continue sharing their data or to opt out of the health information exchange. Today, 98.8% .8 of people's records are viewable in the exchange, while 1.2% have chosen to opt out. We've talked about this briefly, Christina mentioned it earlier, um, but really want to spend some time here protecting patient data. This, this is also um, a foundational piece of the work we do, maybe the foundational piece of the work we do. Um, and that's the security of patient data, ensuring appropriate access, and honoring patients' rights and preferences. So this is a commitment we've made, and practically it means that we will continuously review and update our security and recovery practices to ensure they align with best practices and to mitigate the ever-changing threat landscape. We're also committed to ensuring transparency about how Vermont health information data is shared, to monitoring and aligning with regulatory changes, and to maintaining agreements and controls to ensure appropriate sharing of health data. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our patient education, because the data that we, we think every day about how the data that we share is ultimately information about an individual, about a person um, who, whose rights and whose preferences we work to, to respect and to honor. And one of the ways that we do that is through public education. So um, years ago, I was doing focus groups um, as a consultant to, to Vital with patients um, about their data sharing preferences and needs. And what I heard over and over again was that they wanted to hear about data sharing, about how their data was going to be shared from the organizations where they received care. So in order to support that, VITAL has developed a, a whole toolkit of consent education resources that those organizations, the data contributors, can use to help educate patients. And we, we encourage them to go ahead and well, we, we expect that they include information in their notice of privacy practices. And we encourage them to share flyers, which we've got translated into nine languages, um, brochures, posters, um, we've also got um, social um, media resources and videos that they can share. And we've built a website that's specific for patients and that really, you know, you hear us today being careful about acronyms. We'll say an acronym and then we'll say, and then we'll uh, try and spell it out because it's so easy in this world to talk in language that um, is not patient friendly. So we work really hard to maintain patient education resources in plain language. And you'll see that on our patient website. We've also recently, and we'll talk about this more in our quarterly update, done um, some direct to patient outreach and, and um, communications through uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, recognizing that that is a really positive way to supplement the education that providers are doing with their patients. And I'm going to turn it over to Beth for the next slide, which is about how Vital and the Vermont Health Information Exchange is funded. Thanks, Maureen. Um, just to give you a uh, sense of how we are funded and how we do the work that we do, um, we about 95% of our current funding comes through an annual deliverables-based contract with the state of Vermont through the Agency of Human Services. Um, that funding comes from a combination of state funds, which are used to match and leverage CMS funds um, to support this work. And you'll hear more about that, I think, later, to, later today when Kristen goes through the HIE plan. Um, we get funding for two kind of components of work, both um, maintenance and operations work as well as development work. So the maintenance and operations is the 
um, supports our work to keep the platform running, keep the data secure and run our security program, um, ensure the data is flowing in and out, keep the connections live with the healthcare providers submitting data, make sure we are getting the data out to the, the purposes that it is intended to get out to um, provider portal feeds. Also provides for training and education, both for um, healthcare providers about how to use the data and access our services, as well as for the patient consent education that Maureen was just talking about. Um, in addition to the MNO funding, we get um, uh, varying funding each year for what CMS refers to as development design and installation or DDI programs. And that's really to invest in creating new capabilities for the HIE. Um, so some of the work we did this year, for an example, are we're creating a new provider portal, which is more user friendly. It could be putting in new reporting capabilities, implementing a new MPI to do better patient matching and having a much more um, complete patient record. Um, in addition to the state funding, we do generate about 5% of our budget from um, other work that we do, and that um, is a combination of services. Some is where we do custom reporting and provide custom data needs for stakeholders in the state. Um, we also support some event notification services that providers and, and hospitals use um, to, to access patient data that they want, very specific patient data that they want, um, and we do bring in some additional funding through those needs. Um, we are continue to explore um, what our funding model looks like. So the state continues to fund the implementation and maintenance of the VHI, and as you'll hear later, really expanding that into the unified health data space and really a more robust platform for serving the needs of stakeholders across the state. Um, we continue to explore opportunities to ensure that we're allowing um, VITAL to continue to innovate and meet needs of individual um, or smaller sets of stakeholders um, that might have needs or, or valuable uses of the data and figuring out how we have a really um, strong business model, an operational model that can support those needs and ensure um, that we can continue to deliver the needs of the state and maintain a kind of diverse and sustainable business um, or an organization to continue. I think with that, I will turn it back to Maureen. Great, thanks, Beth. So now I wanna zero in on some of the um, really important work that we've done in the past couple of years. And when I think about that time period, one of the things that stands out is VITAL's partnership with the Vermont Department of Health. During um, the COVID pandemic, real opportunities emerged for health information exchanges across the country to demonstrate real value in support of public health. There was opportunity there before. I think um, this accelerated the realization of that opportunity all across the country and certainly in Vermont. So er very early on, we worked to connect new testing sites um, with COVID testing data, and we continue to onboard uh, new testing sites. We also have been working to collect and deliver more immunization records from, from more places. I mentioned pharmacies earlier, many new pharmacy contributors in the last couple of years. At this point, we are delivering about 78% of the immunization records that are in the Vermont Health Inform sorry, the Vermont Immunization Registry maintained by the Vermont Department of Health. About 78% of those get to the Vermont Department of Health through VITAL and the Vermont Health Information Exchange, we make that automatic. So the flow from the practices or the pharmacies to VDH happens automatically through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. We also are delivering daily reporting about hospitalizations and resource usage. And we are supporting through um, VITAL access case investigations and contact tracing. So there's been quite a lot of use of vital access by Vermont Department of Health staff for this purpose. And then right now there's some new work that, that we are doing and that includes development of bi-directional immunization registry connections so that not only can the providers send data to the immunization registry, but they can also query data back from the immunization registry and say, all right, tell me all of the immunizations that my patient has had without um, going and logging into another system. They can do it right from their own EHR once these bi-directional connections are in place. We're also working on um, health equity strategies with the Vermont Department of Health. There's some promising early work during the pandemic where um, 
initially the Department of Health, when they were uh, um, evaluating COVID cases, had race and ethnicity information for only, um, or for, it was unknown in 73% of cases. And then they were able to incorporate Vermont Health Information Exchange data, and it was, it was reduced to only 8% um, unknown. And that was really important for evaluating the impact of the pandemic and how that impacted different communities differently. We're also expanding our lab reporting. We know that that COVID is not the last thing that, that we're going to have to work with the Vermont Department of Health on. So um, monkeypox is something that we are now um, beginning to make sure that there's connections to report on. And we're doing some strategic planning for closer integration of Vermont Department of Health and um, Vermont Health Information Exchange data systems. So also in 2022, um, we developed a regional collaboration of health information exchanges. This is a connection between health information or health infonet in Maine, um, and not a literal connection. We'll get to that in a moment. This is really about connecting the organizations. Um, health infonet in Maine, the Rhode Island Inst the Rhode Island Quality Initiative, Ricky, um, and us at Vital. So we'd been, you know, talking casually for, for a while and learning from each other and realizing that having a really formal agreement in place would allow us to better share what we're doing, um, freely discuss uh, the work that we're doing and, and best practices, um, share innovative thinking, learn from each other um, and explore opportunities for joint initiatives. This is really about looking for efficiency. We are all small states um, with small health information exchanges and we want to think about how we can learn from each other and support each other, um, take what's best at each organization and leverage it. There's also some opportunity here to access data, to work together to access data from regional specialty centers. So we hear again and again that, especially for folks with really complex conditions, um, especially for children with really complex conditions, data from um, Boston specialty centers would be helpful in their care. And we think we're going to be better able to access that together than we might be alone. And that is where I will end it. Um, our last slide is just some highlights from our last annual report, some numbers about what we what we do. But I'll stop there. Thank you all very much. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the board for any questions or comments that any board members may have. Uh, Mr. Walsh, you're the only one not shaking your head. Do you have any questions, Tom? Sure. Well, I'm interested in the, the quarterly update, um, but um, I appreciate the overview, right? As a newer board member, not having been through this, um, the the acronyms are difficult <laughs> and I, I really appreciate um, what you're trying to do. And in, in um, some of my other work, I've, I've learned HIEs um, are, are having some difficulty, right? The, the Idaho HIE just went bankrupt in April of, of this year. And um, finding a funding source <clears throat> to continue this work after the federal funding kind of dries up is difficult and I really appreciate the effort that you've all um, made to secure some of that. I was reading through the report about the um, some of the uh, Medicaid funding that had um, um, been secured, which I think is is terrific. Um, I think th there's a note of caution that goes through my head as I'm 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 reading through this material. A lot of the improved care coordination. Um, improved communication it reminds me a lot of what um, was being said about electronic health records when I was a clinician. Um, and those promises never were fully realized. And instead, they've kind of been um, hijacked to, to um, be used to improve revenue. And they they get overly complex and overly burdensome, and we can't do some really simple things. And so I just I'd caution folks with these efforts, like 
um, before trying to get bigger and more complex and include more and more data sets and um, fancier and fancier analysis, like I like statistics, it's kind of fun um, to pull in data streams and run um, fancy regressions. But from a clinical standpoint, just being able to identify how many of my patients have diabetes. And of those, how many have an A1C level greater than nine? Like who are the really sick patients? Um, and being able to do that type of thing with all ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Who has COPD or CHF? Who, who have a positive test that indicate that they're really sick? And then who hasn't been seen in the last six months for diabetes? Like that's a standard interval. So if the patient is beyond that interval, the care is not really going to standard. Um, and that can be an indication of other things that are making it difficult to comply with recommended care. Um, and, and assigning um, treatment protocols that may not be appropriate for a person at that time. So who hasn't been seen in six months, in the past six months? How many people with that diagnosis have ended up in the emergency department because of that diagnosis? And how many people have been, um, had an unplanned inpatient stay because of that diagnosis? And none of that is particularly difficult. It's not hard math, right? It's, it's, it's division, but it's really hard to pull that information together and to be able to give a provider system a report on 12 ambulatory care sensitive conditions on a routine basis. But if I were running a healthcare system, I'd want my health information exchange to be able to produce that for me anytime I asked. And it's, it's really hard <laughs> to do. I, you can talk about it and it sounds easy, but it's really hard. But I worry sometimes we get so interested in the forest and growing a big forest that we can't execute on those simple things. So I, I'd, I'd really like to um, see Vermont succeed on being able to deliver that crucial information to providers so they can use it and we can monitor the, pro the effectiveness of our system with data like that. May I respond to that? I know it wasn't a question, but I think uh, information that may be interesting. Please, sure, please. I'd love to. Thanks. Um, one, I very much appreciate your point about um, thinking about how we make sure we're kind of meeting the foundation and the point of care work um, in our work. And, you know, one of the things, and you'll hear a little bit more about this later, um, is, you know, the, the state's investment are also guided by an HIE steering committee, which does represent across healthcare organizations and providers. Um, so so they do they're, try to ensure that there is a voice in making the decisions about where we go forward, which I think is really helpful. Um, and I absolutely hear um, what you're saying about the providers and something, and you know, I know Maureen hears it and frequently in conversations with our, our the organizations, the healthcare organizations that we work with. And it's something we are looking at doing going forward. Um, some of the work I think we have on our roadmap is really building dashboards for providers. And, and some of that I think um, would be things like the risk analysis. Like we have data sets that allow us to tell and tell things that you can't do just out of one EHR, right? If you someone's due for their mammography, you might not know that they went to Dartmouth for it, right? But we might have that information to be able to do it. Um, and that's, that's absolutely things we're looking at being able to do going forward. And it's, it's gonna be an evolving process. We will not be able to solve it all day one, but, you know, prioritizing and trying to take steps forward to make the information available for all of the providers, too. And I think that's an important piece of our work, not just the ones who have the money to spend on um, the big cis fancy systems, but how can we make it uh, usable and approachable for everyone? Yeah. Thank you. That's yes, I agree. Um, I had a couple quick questions. Um, you spoke about the patient consent preferences. Um, as a patient, when do I get that and from whom do I get it? When I go into, let's say, urgent care, my primary care, they give me a form of some variety. Is that where I consent to my information going to vital and how it's used by vital? 
I mean, do you want me to answer that or do you want to? I can take it. Um, so typically when you establish care at a organization, you will have to, um, you'll receive a notice of privacy practices and that information should be included in your notice of privacy practices that data will be shared with the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Um, we also see many organizations doing things like posting notices um, next to registration desks, like making brochures available. Um, there's a variety of different ways they do it, but the foundational one is in the notice of privacy practices. Great, so you get that from whoever, wherever you established your care, not from VITAL itself. That's right. And then um, how, if I just go to an urgent care, let's say randomly, how do I know if Vital got my information? Does it just depend on whether or not you have a relationship where with where wherever I happen to go? That that's right. And um, the urgent cares that are affiliated with the organizations that we mentioned earlier are sending data. I know you're not asking really specifically about urgent cares, but but there are some that aren't. Um, some of the the national chains we are not connected to. Um, so it does depend on who's contributing data. And then slide seven, you spoke a little bit about having, I think it was called terminology services to translate some of the required vocabulary codes, Rx norm for medications and prescriptions, SNOMED for diagnoses, LOINC for labs. Um, and that caught my ear because I think here in Vermont, there's been enforcement actions of over $400 million against four national leading EMRs for failing to comply with those requirements. Are you seeing um, do you are you seeing gaps in those required vocabulary codes being included in the information translated over to you? I think sometimes what we see is especially in um, historical messages where the codes might not have been applied in the past and we need to do those mappings. Um, it's a it's a really great question about you know what we might be seeing and patterns. Um, most of the time, it's that historical data, and there are we might get new codes that have not been um, mapped. It might be a code and code system that we recognize. It just might not be a code set that can be used across um, for uh, specific custom reports. So, for example. Um, an organization that might want to have uh, data in SNOMED instead of LOINC, we might need to make sure that we translate it over to that so that we can share that data. Those are the two that that jump to mind. Do you, do you folks keep track of um, you know, the st any statistics on compliance with those requirements of the information coming over? Because I think those vocabulary codes, the big ones that you mentioned, have been required since the 2014 edition mm -hmm. um, under meaningful use, so eight years ago. Do you guys have stats on which ones are on gaps that people are having? No. Um, Again, an evolving HIE. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand, yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't have any other questions myself. Thank you guys very much for for sure. for doing this. This is same as Tom. This is really helpful for me. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, the HCA for any questions or comments they may have. Thanks much. Uh, just one question, and thank you. I'll start off by thanking everyone for the presentation. As a self-identified data nerd, this is always oh, a fun conversation to have. Um, I wonder if you could speak just broadly to the data safeguards in place, particularly for health equity related data. Um, as, as, and this is a really important priority, obviously, but I think it'd be good for just the general public to know what safeguards are in place. Thanks. So I'm not sure I fully understand your question. So let me try and answer and tell me if I don't get sure. it. Okay, and my team yeah. will help me here. Um, so we protect all the data as protected health information. It comes from um, healthcare organizations and it's covered by the traditional HIPAA regulations and service agreements and business associates agreements we have in place. We are not getting um, any data outside of um, traditional demographic data that comes with those records or information right now that uh, would be considered 
difference. Uh, as we go down the path of thinking about new data types like social determinants of health data, um, things are substance use data, things like that, we are um, we're having conversations, very careful conversations about what the right approach is. And that's from the start with the patient consent and education so they know what's happening, but then also what the right, um, the right way to kind of protect and share the data would be um, when we get to those places. Thank you, super helpful. That, okay, great. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to public comment via the raise your hand function. Great, um, seeing none, uh, we're scheduled to go to 11.45 with this segment. Um, why don't we take a quick five minute break just so you guys can get, get set up again. And I think we'll just go on to your next segment, which was supposed to start at one. We'll just keep trucking through. Um, so we'll be back in five minutes. If you guys need more time than that, let me know. Are you good with five? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so we'll be back you. at 11.06 and uh, we'll proceed, thank you.
Okay, uh, it's 11.06, so uh, we'll continue on. Um, Ms. Anderson, is everyone uh, present on your side or do you need another moment? I can, I know Maureen is back on her way and I can get us started because I have. I see Maureen. Oh, there she is, perfect. Okay. Great, okay. But yes, um, others may, or, yep, we have our team. Thank you great, for checking. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you in a second here, but we're we're going to be going through Vital's uh, quarterly update, and I see we have two additional new faces being added for this. And if you guys could just introduce yourselves uh, to us all, we'd appreciate it. And um, take it away. Great. So I'll just point them out. So in it. Oh, thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm Bob Turneau, um, CFO for Vital. Um, for the next couple months. Um, and Sue? Okay, Sue Fritz, the Director of Technology. Um, I've been here for a little over a year now. Pleasure to meet y'all. Great, so we will dive in. We do my displaying again. Thank you. So I'll start us off again. Um, wanted to take just a few minutes to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the work we've done to date um, since our last update, um, and then talk a little bit about our contract going forward or our thoughts on the contract going forward um, for the next fiscal year or calendar year, sorry. Um, so just to talk through some achievements, because we haven't been in front of you since um, June, uh, we successfully completed launch of the new provider portal out to all of our providers and more um, have had some really great feedback on the portal being much more usable and user friendly. The data is much more accessible. Um, so we're really excited about that and the opportunity there for providers really to get insight into the data that we have in the HIE. Some other work, the team has been um, working closely with the Vermont Department of Health to build um, a, what's called a bi-directional interface with the immunization registry, which is going to allow provider organizations to query the immunization registry through us um, to get up-to-date immunization data. The first steps are to get the immunization records um, after we will be looking at adding additional functionality, um, things like allowing them to get um, forecasts. Um, we had a big public education campaign, which Maureen will talk with you about in a bit. Uh, we did successfully retire our old platform, which we were very excited about. Um, we were able to make the transition fully to the new platform. You've heard us talk a lot about that in the past. Um, we're taking steps to really expand our reporting platform out so we can do some of those custom reports in the dashboards that we talked about. Uh, and we have been working with um, the team at the Medicaid agency to help them have the data they need to meet their Cures Act final rule requirements around information blocking. So some exciting work going on. Um, we jump to the next slide. As many of you know, and others of you will get comfortable, get used to, is this is usually the time of year where we were talking about our new contract with the Agency for Human Services or with the Medicaid agency. We typically do an annual contract, which is on a calendar year basis. And so usually at this time of year, we're submitting the contract to the Centers for Medicaid and Medica Medicare and Medicaid for their approval with the thought of signing a new contract for the January 1 calendar year. What we're looking to do actually this year now is to align our state contract with um, our fiscal year and the state's fiscal year. As it stands now, we have a mismatch. We are on the same fiscal year as the state, but our contract is on a calendar year, which makes it hard sometimes to do planning and certainly to do our budgeting because we're often budgeting based upon a guess at what the next year's contract will be. Um, so what we, we are doing now is talking about a six month extension to our current calendar year contract, which will take us through June, 2023, um, and then signing annual contracts aligned to the fiscal year starting July, 2023 going forward. Um, so what you will expect from us is, or you should should be um, seeing from us in, in January, what well, we will be doing in January with our board and bringing to you in February is an amendment to our current year um, budget, which will reflect the changes that we expect for that six month contract. 
Um, I mean, so I'll walk you through in just a minute some exciting um, opportunities to do some work that we hadn't anticipated we'd be able to do, um, which will which will impact our budget. Um, so Maureen, if you don't mind jumping to the next slide, please. Um, the contract um, that has been submitted to CMS has not been approved. We usually, as you know, don't find out about that until December, um, but it usually um, is pretty aligned with this. We'll be um, continuing the maintenance and operations funding um, as we had this year to continue to operate the VHI, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we will continue to have funding to create data connections to get new data into the HIE. We're really excited about this because you've heard us mention in the past that we weren't sure that CMS funding would be available to allow that work. Um, and it's looking like the monies um, can be made available to continue to expand the data that we do have available. Um, we'll be putting some work into um, making uh, building capabilities to provide de-identified data sets. Um, first use case is really for public health needs. So right now we cannot provide de-identified data. It's only with patient, demogra uh, patient demographic information in there. And what we're really hoping to do is be able to provide that um, data so it can be used for more purposes um, for their analytics work. And then potentially in the future, this hopefully uh, opens some new use cases around research and other needs as well. Um, We'll be working with um, AHS to coordinate with the designated agencies to get um, their their data into the HIE. And as many of you know, that they're currently covered under 42 CFR Part 2 Substance Use Disorder Guidelines, which provide for um, very different uh, capabilities to share and access that data. And we'll be working very carefully with the state and with the agencies to make sure that we were doing, we were making that data, um, securing that data in the appropriate ways and ensuring patients understand what what is happening and where their data will be. Um, we uh, have additional funding to continue some work we're doing with the state on social determinants of health data, really looking at getting some of the state data sets um, integrated into the HIE to help inform a more holistic picture of the patient and the patient's health situation. So um, information from the VCCI, potentially economic services, so we can really understand not just the the patient's kind of current diagnoses and situations, but the the external factors that may impact their health to help make sure that their care is kind of guided and coordinated in the appropriate ways that that is makes them successful. Um, we will continue our work to um, build connections to allow providers to access the data in the immunization registry, which I mentioned a moment ago. Um, and we will also continue our work with the um, by states Vermont Rural Health Alliance activities. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we expect to get the CMS decision back in December. We will do our final contracting um, hopefully by December 31st uh, with the goal of having an updated budget for you to review with those changes. Additional piece of work we continue talking about that we've mentioned in the past that will not be in that change, um, but will potentially follow that is we continue our conversations with the Medicaid agencies to have the HIE serve as part of its new data and analytics capabilities um, and infrastructure. Um, that is conversations we continue to have and negotiating what that work might look like and designing capabilities. We're expecting that that contract would likely come to be in the spring as well. So that's something we will keep you updated on uh, as we get closer and more clear on what that looks like. Um, one thing I do want to mention, Bob kind of um, alluded to this and his telling you he'll only be around for a few more months, but I do want to let everyone know that Bob has unfortunately decided to retire. Um, we are lucky in that he's stuck with us for longer than we expected when he first made his decision, um, but unfortunately he will be leaving us as soon as it gets warm enough again for him to sail. Um, so you will likely see him or potentially see him again when we come back with a budget amendment, but, um, but I wanted to let you know that we will be having a transition in that position. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Maureen, who will talk to you in a little bit of detail about the patient education that's been happening. All right. So the last, you know, couple years um, of presenting to you, we so often had to say, or we repeatedly had to say, now isn't the time for for broad public education about the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Of course, notice of privacy practices. Of course, messages in providers' offices. But we didn't think during peak COVID it was the time to be uh, broadcasting information about the. Um, Vermont Health Information Exchange, and I'm so pleased to um, 
to be in a place where we're able to do that again, where it feels right to be um, out uh, doing the direct to the public education again. So between June and September of 2023, we did an education campaign on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram with messaging focused on how health data is shared. This was a statewide campaign targeting all age groups, 4.3 million video plays on Facebook and Instagram, and about half a million video views on YouTube. Um, now, the goal here is really about awareness. There's not a conversion we're looking for. We're not looking to drive um, you know, opt outs, um, certainly, um, unless that's people's preference. Um, so the the metrics that that we have to share with you are really about reach and about um, awareness. And this is a continuing commitment for us. So um, we will be back here talking about about our public education efforts uh, again and again, I hope. So the next topic is going to be a projects update, and I'm going to hand it over to Christina. Thanks, Maureen. Next slide, please. So I'll give you an overview of some of the exciting projects that we are working on. Um, obviously, having data in the VHI is extremely important, especially getting that data real time. Um, so we have been working very closely with the Department of Health in order to prioritize the data that's needed, especially um, during the time of COVID in order to get vaccination reports and laboratory uh, laboratory reports so that we can keep uh, Vermonters healthy. So we've been working with them to prioritize that and that really is our, our um, highest priority at this moment. We have been working with healthcare organizations because we don't want to have gaps in data as they may switch electronic health records. Um, after we establish data and we we have that data coming into the system, if an organization decides to move to another platform, we want to be there in order to minimize the data gaps and have that data flowing in through their new system. So we're doing that um, while not risking the public health interface data coming in. We've also been working with Medicaid. Um, they needed to be in compliance with the CMS interoperability and patient access rule so that uh, members of Medicaid can access their data and they needed custom clinical data sets to be provided to them. And we continue to work with them on that uh, work so that they have that data to provide. And Beth gave you an overview of this, and I'll add a bit more flavor about the uh, immunization registry work. So working with the Department of Health, um, we have implemented an approach so that providers right from their electronic health record would be able to query right through VITAL onto the immunization registry to request immunization data so that they can see it right within their own EHR. Um, it's exciting to me because this is a very dynamic type of interface. It's not setting up a connection and just receiving data and then turning around and sending it somewhere. It's very dynamic in that it is within the provider's EHR and it um, it's you know, within their own workflow, they'll be able to get that data and care for their patients. And we've completed that configuration testing and we're already working with one hospital to ensure that this is a repeatable process and we can continue to roll that out through the funding mechanism that Beth was talking about earlier. Next slide, please. Oh, this one has some um, acronyms in it. So we are um, planning a design and implementation, again, of that fast healthcare interoperability resource. Um, it's an application programming interface or API. Um, this is also a, very exciting to me because this is really the reason why we implemented a fire native platform, that next evolution of HIE so that you can set up APIs to access data in a very, very standard and usable format. Um, and we hope that this will set up for 
patients and providers to be able to access data more easily within their EHRs and use it um, at the point of care and beyond. We're also working with uh, the Agency of Human Services in order to ingest social determinants of health data um, that's being collected by the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative. We've worked on templates that can be used in implementation design, and now we're working with them in order to collect that data and work through an ingestion process um, and determining how it can be shared in the future with um, consent and education in place. We're also working on our reporting infrastructure now that we've implemented the new FIRE platform. We have a reporting infrastructure and we've already used it to deliver two Blueprint for Health reports. And we're using that for other purposes as well. We're working with the Vermont Department of Health again on um, reassessing their needs for COVID reports using that new reporting infrastructure. And we're also upgrading to the latest fire standard. There's a version four that is needed for um, those APIs that I was talking about earlier in that first bullet. It's a standard way and a standard version in order to um, send data through those fire APIs. And we want to get onto that new version. And lastly, um, we are making updates to our clinical portal. We're looking at a, a medication fill history service so that we can get information about whether um, patients have actually filled their medications and have that available within the provider portal. And we're also working to connect to national uh, health exchange networks. The eHealth Exchange right now is one of them that we are uh, testing with in order to expand uh, nationwide so that we can query for data. I think that's it for my slides. On to a security update and Sue will speak to this. Thanks, Christina. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Maureen. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, give you some little details about what we've been doing with security over the last quarter. Um, call out to the slide, you've heard us say it multiple times, the privacy and security of this data is really important to us. And we engage in a continuous program to always monitor and improve the work that we're doing. At the core of that is policy and standards, and we've actually been doing quite a bit of um, work with policies and standards recently, you know, as the funding model and regulatory environment is constantly changing around us, there's always this need to look back. So we have a great security framework. It has historically been based on the NIST CFS. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies has various different fr frameworks, and we've been following the NIST CFS fr framework for many years. We are starting to morph that program more towards the NIST um, 853 framework and subset of controls specifically with um, a view towards the MARS-E minimal, minimal acceptable risks for health exchanges or for exchanges. Um, that's just the nature of where we're going as an HIE and our, our involvement in the Medicaid space and our, our, our future work. So that's a lot of the work that we're doing is reviewing and updating our policies to set ourselves on a great path for that moving forward. Um, as most organizations um, recognize, there's always this new changing dynamic with creating a remote workforce. So we've been doing a significant amount of work streamlining our, our, our we made the move to COVID and work from home very effectively and very securely because by the nature of our work, we had to do that um, prior to COVID. But now we're um, trying to streamline the processes, be able to deliver services to our workforce that um, meet all those security standards in a much more streamlined and fast way. So we've been doing a lot of work in that space. Um, we've also had a great cybersecurity and awareness training program, but it didn't have the streamlined, formatted, documented processes that we really wanted to achieve to cut down on the, uh, um, the work efforts and the manual work efforts. So we've procured a platform that can deliver automated trainings to the staff, um, track the monitor and monitor the program throughout the year and make sure that we have good data at the end of the year to evaluate progress and, and make a good plan for the next year. Um, 
We have a security and event monitoring system for those who aren't technical. This is a system that actually digs into the AI and all of your logging from your systems to try and um, analyze and correlate events across your network infrastructure to see if there's malicious behavior going on. Um, that's a key tool that all um, IT platforms or IT environments use to help make sure um, we're staying abreast of the bad guys in the world. and. Uh, we continuously update and and add new logs to that, look for new ways to enhance that AI. Um, we went through our, it's almost funny that renewing cyber security insurance has to be something that's worthy of mentioning to you all, but if, for those who have to do this, then you know that this is a big accomplishment when you're able to say, we renewed our cybersecurity insurance this year. Um, so that's something that I wanted to draw to everybody's attention. And in addition, I, my last bullet was an annual penetration testing. We go through a, a series of assessments throughout the year. Um, the one that's relevant and up-to-date are coming up on our um, roadmap is the penetration test that we go through every year to see if bad guys can hack into our network. And so that's been contracted and scheduled. I think that's everything that I have. And I think, who are we going to next? Bob's up next. I actually think you're stuck with me doing this presentation. That was part oh, of the okay. negotiation of keeping Bob around for longer. Um, so well, um, this will be a quick update um, because we are very early in a new fiscal year. Um, but so you know, we are um, Bob's team is working up to wrap up the fiscal year 22 audit. Um, we will have that to you when that is completed. Our early signs are Bob's team did a great job. No findings. Um, we're kind of where we expected. Performance is actually going to be better than we anticipated when we spoke to you in June, um, which is which is good to not have any big surprises. Um, but more details on that to come. Um, fiscal year 23, as I mentioned, we are presenting or the next page, uh, next slide has our performance through September 30th, which is really just three months into the new fiscal year. Um, and, you know, nothing really significant to note. We are behind on revenues. It's a combination of two things. One, shift in project priorities. We did our budget based on some assumptions about the order of projects and how they would happen this year. But after some work with Agency for Human Services and, and looking at some different needs, um, we rejiggered kind of our schedule of projects. And so, so the shift in some of the revenues is really just due to the timing on projects. Likewise, you'll see um, the expenses are below, um, again, due to some of the project priorities and where we're spending on the projects. Um, some of the change or some of the, the kind of lower performance on revenue is actually not lower performance. It's on recognized revenues. We deferred an FY22 that we um, will recognize or expect to recognize this year, but we wait till the audit is completed to make sure we've accounted those properly um, before we recognize them in a new year. Um, so that is more just an accounting um, activity more than anything else. Um, so I think that is most of the highlights um, to report as of September. And I will then I think pass it back to Maureen who will go through some of the our metrics that we, we provide. Thanks Beth. Um, so in these quarterly reports, we always present the same set of metrics uh, about kind of high level how how things are going at the Vermont Health Information Exchange. I'm always open to looking at this differently, but these are sort of the core things that we've been reporting on in, in recent years. One is the percent of Vermont patients who are opted out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Um, you can see this is, is fairly steady. Um, there was a drop in April, which was due to the addition of a large group of new patient identities um, from the import of historical data from a large COVID testing laboratory. So as you bring in um, large new data sets and then um, new, new people really to the Vermont Health Information Exchange, you do tend to see a bit of a decline. The next one is about queries of vital access, our clinical portal by organization type. This is really a story about who's using the Vermont Health Information Exchange um, through vital access. And there's, there's a diverse group of organizations who are using that tool. So we've got um, many independent practices. You've got some hospitals, though I would say more reliance from independent practices relative to size on the tool, um, quite a lot of use by the Vermont Department of Health. We actually have emergency medical services who um, were initially brought on early in the pandemic and they are using the tool quite frequently. 
federally qualified health centers are um, visibly in the mix there as well. So this is vital access queries by month. Um, this is really just for the past year. I will say that this is an ongoing upward trend. We are, are pleased to see some growth over time here. Um, what the story for this past year is really about um, big use by the Vermont Department of Health during uh, COVID to do those case investigations and that contact tracing. Um, so if you put a line under this that just shows use without the Vermont Department of Health, it, you see um, real steadiness here. Um, so it's great that the Vermont Department of Health is able to um, use this uh, when when needed. And there are some other um, uses that the Department of Health has for vital access as well. Um, the purple line here is the new vital access. The blue line is the old vital access. Pilot of the new vital access began in February. Um, we did some, some really, uh, mm, well, very early co-design work and then some piloting with a group of people who were especially interested in the tool um, and were able to give us some great feedback. Um, and now you see that the new vital access is the only vital access and there's some steady use there, a um, little under 10,000 queries per month. This is about queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange via eHealth Exchange. Um, we were driving eHealth Exchange access off of our old data platform. We haven't talked a lot today about the transition in our data platform, um, but there was a, a change there and we uh, decommissioned our eHealth Exchange connection in June of 2022. And we can't get reconnected in exactly the same way because eHealth Exchange requires that any new connections be through their hub model. And we are excited to be part of that hub model. Um, but it is a different way of connecting, and we're currently working on technical and process planning for delivering data through the eHealth Exchange hub. This is results delivery by results type. I think um, the number here that's most interesting to me is actually in the smallest print, which is the number of providers who are receiving results directly in their EHR. Down at the bottom, that's 592 providers in Vermont who are um, getting results for the lab tests they ordered or the imaging that they ordered in their EHR through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And you can see here in orange that um, the majority of the results we deliver are lab results. Um, then there's radiology results and uh, transcribed reports are also delivered in this way. Um, some steadiness here as well, a uh, little under, um, 100,000 results delivered right now per month. This um, graph is about who receives these results, um, who's relying on results delivery. And what you see here is it's really two types of organizations who are relying on this service. And it's the federally qualified health centers and it's the independent practices because typically they are ordering these uh, lab tests from, from a, a laboratory, a commercial laboratory or from a hospital um, more typically. And then we deliver those results back into their EHR. So big service here to the independent practices and to the federally qualified health centers. And that is my last slide. We do have some abbreviations for reference, um, and I will stop it there. Um, great. Um, I'll go a little out of order and just congratulate Mr. Turno on first his shrewd negotiating to get out of the financial performance, and uh, second his upcoming retirement. Congratulations, Bob. I'm sure it's well deserved and a, an excellent career. So congrats. Um, I'll turn it over to my fellow board members for any questions or comments they may have. I can go ahead and go first. Um, hi all, nice to see you again. Um, so I had a couple of questions. One is Beth, you mentioned uh, in terms of the work that you're doing with VDH and the bi-directional immunization data that you're starting with the records first and then you're moving on to forecasts. Can you talk about what is a forecast and why are they helpful for you to ingest those? 
I'll, I'll start and Christine is going to correct me where she doesn't like my answer, I'm sure. Um, so the forecast gives a, a, literally a forecast of what immunizations would be coming due for a patient. So based upon the record that they have of what they have had, their age, all the things that go into deciding what immunizations a person should have, um, it then returns back to the provider what, what should be anticipated. So it sounds like that would be particularly helpful for providers that don't have an EHR, for example, but might be seeing yeah. a patient. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's, you know, an EHR that doesn't have that capability. And I do believe many providers can get this out of the immunization registry now by logging into it, but then they have to go into a separate section. And depending on if it's um, someone within the provider's office, like a nurse, as opposed to the provider needing access to the data, I think it can create some challenges of making sure they have it. Great, thanks. Um, that's helpful because, quite frankly, I think my provider has that already in their EHR. So, because um, yeah. I get questions about it. So, thank you for explaining yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, the, I think um, the value yeah. here, I'm sorry not to interrupt, yeah, is um, that Please. this is then based on the immunization registry data too, right? So if you had an immunization at a kidney drug or something, it would have potentially like, all of that information to give the most complete forecast. Great. Um, so my second question is about the social determinants of health data. Um, it sounds like you, you've started al already with VCCI. Um, did you, do you have any policy updates related to security or privacy related to the VCCI data? And is it appropriate to have separate policies for that data? Or are you thinking that it's covered by your existing policies? That's a great question. So the, the initial focus on that project, and again, either Christina or Kristen um, may want to add here. Um, we are, the focus really now was on testing that we can get the data on what it would take to map it in. Do we have the right infrastructure to capture the data with the full intent that before any of that data was really used for any purposes or shared, we would, we would definitely, we need to address the kind of what the data is, what the expectations for the patient not always a patient at that point, but the person, the individual should be um, and what kind of education we need to do. So we are, it, we know we need to do that work, but we haven't completed it all yet. Okay. Um, it would, and would you expect to have a similar process, do the testing, figure out the data mapping, and then those follow-up steps for new types of data that you would be expanding to? I'm not sure that's always the order it would happen in. Um, sometimes, you know, it's particularly for more, um, more uh, complex data types, we, you know, the, the patient and education and uh, consent would be more of the upfront work around the data governance work that we would do. I think, although, you know, we're going to have to take that more on a data set by data set basis on this is just another very similar to what we already have, or this is really something new that we really need to dig in on and make sure we have addressed the um, all of the components that go into it. Thanks. So is that work that VITAL will do independently, or is that work that will happen at the HIE steering committee level? A uh, combination of work. So um, we would do it with uh, either the steering committee or a subcommittee of the steering committee, which is often where this work done. So a group of people with specific knowledge or interest get together to focus on the different topics. And that's how um, the social determinants of health work is working um, and to dig in. But it, we also engage, um, oftentimes we'll engage the making sure that the organizations providing the data are involved in that conversation. And obviously, we take legal both from this, the providing organization's perspective, but are legal at the VHI too, to make sure that we are keeping in compliance with the laws from a, you know, there is the practice and we really want to make sure that we are meeting what we need to do. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, oh, um, in terms of the vital access query data, are you expecting to stay around that 9,000 mark for, for queries? Are you expecting that to go up or down in the next year? Where are you? Where do you think that's headed? Maureen, do you want to take that one or do you want me? Sure. Um, I would expect to see it about that mark unless there's a reason um, uh, why there needs to be a surge like VDH's use um, during COVID. I think there's always opportunity for, for growth there, um, but it is sort of 
steady uh, work of going in, educating the practices. We find that they tend to, to use it a lot more if they've had recent education. Um, so there's there's some work behind um, growth there. Um, and, and we do think that there is opportunity for growth, but I don't see it being sort of large, uh, dramatic growth. I see it being sort of steady, incremental. Do you have any way to measure kind of how much of the universe you've captured? So for example, uh, on the next slide after that, there's an indication that FQHCs and independents tend to be a big utilizer of that particular functionality. Do you have any sense of how many independents uh, that you've educated and are currently using it compared to the total universe or similar for FQHCs? We can make some guesses on that. Um, we don't have the the precise number of practices in Vermont. I think that's a challenge for for all um, organizations knowing exactly which practices are currently sure. operating. Um, but um, there's been opportunity at I think most of the practices, and I think there's always opportunity for more education. I will say there's certain types of practices that we're seeing um, more use from recently. I know. Um, uh, naturopaths who do primary care are, are using it quite a lot. Um, so mm -hmm. there's some growth there. Great. Um, and then I think my last question is in terms of the eHealth exchange um, reconnection to the hub, do you have a sense of timing that you can give us? I'll pass yeah. that to Christina. Oh, okay, Beth. No. We're, we're targeting that for the end of this year. December 31st. Great. That's it for me. Thank you. Oh, I guess one other question. I do have some questions that are more, I would say, related to the HIE. So I think it's appropriate to hold those until after that presentation. I'm assuming you you will still be around to do the connectivity criteria. Yep. Great. We'll all be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Walsh. Yeah, um, just thanks again. Uh, a couple a couple things um, came to mind. Um, it just, everything sounds very complex, right? There's so much that's going on. And I just want to reiterate the point I tried to make earlier about um, focusing on uh, very actionable, straightforward um, things, um, like being able to identify patients with um, who have a condition that should be amendable with standard visits to primary care, but when it gets bad, they end up in more expensive care. That type of data is just really helpful for health reform efforts because those are the patients that end up becoming um, the most sick, right? And um, similarly, when we're thinking about reform efforts and changing payment policies and or reimbursement um, plans, there's always a worry that if we tweak something about it, patients could be worse off. And so we need timely outcome data in order to make sure that a population isn't getting worse when we're trying to come up with a better model. And the, the quarterly reports that you went over, I, I had these thoughts going through my head at the same time. Um, you know, in addition to the queries and the other information showing how often um, the HIE is being used, um, it'd be really helpful from a state standpoint to understand how many patients, um, across, how many people across the state have a positive depression screen. And then of those with a positive depression screen, how many are able to be seen by a behavioral specialist within a week? or within three weeks or three months or six months, because we have this problem with wait times, right? And then you, if you have those categories, you could then stratify by what proportion end up in the ED for each of those categories, what proportion end up um, with an inpatient admission. Um, and then sadly, we've got very high and rising, a very high and rising suicide rate. What proportion of those people are end up dying by suicide. That type of data um, would help us um, understand the, how the changes in our systems are affecting Vermonters. 
Um, and then with the social determinant data that all the things we can add in from, from your work, we then know how to focus those. So it's, it's uh, very necessary work that you're doing. Um, and I'm, I'm very supportive of it. I do have this nagging worry that it's, it, these type of projects can just grow in expense and grow and grow and grow before we can do some really basic things with it. So um, that, that's my, my recurring thought um, today. But thank you for coming and, and um, giving us this update. I look forward to seeing uh, you regularly. Back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead, Ms. Holmes. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks again for coming today. Um, I actually have a couple questions that are similar to um, board member Lunge's questions, but maybe let me just ask a little bit differently. Um, I am curious very deeply about the social determinants of health data um, and the pilot there. And I, I understand it's VCCI data, but I think there was also mention of economic services data. So I'm curious about, um, I just want to understand a little bit more about uh, you know, how many patients data this might be, um, what types of data this exactly is. And I know it's a pilot right now just to see if you can do the matching and, and get it in there. But I would love to hear more because I do, I'm going to have more questions, I think, in the HIE presentation this afternoon um, about how that data is going to be used, who's going to access it, and what the plans are, uh, you know, about how it will be used. So I'm wondering just from your perspective, if you can give us a little bit of more information about that. Christina, do you want to give a little bit of specifics about what you're doing with the VCCI and then maybe I can address? Yeah, so at this moment, right. So at this moment in time, it's still early on working with VCCI to understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, the eligibility data is the first thing that we're looking at, um, mapping that to taking their questionnaire and mapping that to ways that we can ingest the data. Um, we are also working very closely with DIVA, um, who's working with their state's attorney to make sure that um, we have use cases for this data and again, the protections in place. Um, what we do on the VHI side is also working with our platform vendor to uh, plan out how we're going to securely tag that data or at least put the right security layer on. So once we have the right use case for exposing the data, we know exactly how to protect the data and expose it um, in a way that can be done. So we're still very early on in, in that um, process. So I get and maybe, you know, when you come back, I guess will be what, February or so, um, it'd be helpful to understand a little bit more about this, but I presume that there must be some expected use cases for this or else there wouldn't be a contract in place to explore bringing it in. So can you just give me an example or two of a use case that you're anticipating? Christina, I don't know if you have that yet. I think we're still waiting for the VCCI team and the state team to that is correct. Um, help communicate that. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll ask this afternoon. <laughs> um, maybe there's some, some, well, hopefully we'll hear more about that. Um, okay. I, and my second question, I guess, was around similar to um, board member Lunge's question. And I, and I noticed actually in this afternoon's presentation, um, I'm not sure if you've seen the PowerPoint slides that's, that are coming our way, but there is a final slide that has KPIs on it. And uh, there were a few lines that stood out to me. Uh, one of them was the number of vital access users um, tracked between September 21 to June 22. And the number of vital access users uh, peaked in 21 at about 3,500, and now it's down to 1980. Um, and then there was a, the second line was the number, and this maybe gets a little bit at uh, board member Lunge's question, but maybe not. So I don't know. I, I appreciate more depth on this. But the second line was the number of HCO vital access users, and I'm assuming HCO is healthcare organization, but I may be wrong about that acronym. There's a lot of acronyms here. 
But the sex, so it was the number of HCO vital users divided by the number of potential ACE HCO users. Um, and so in June of 2022, it was 237 divided by 1,593. Um, and that was about the same rate in September 21. That's about a f- like 15% take up rate. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, if you could speak a little bit to those numbers and those would be great metrics. You know, I was really happy to see those, a different way of looking at the use of vital um, and just, you know, maybe in future presentations, it'd be great to see that as well. But I was wondering if you could just speak to both of those. Yeah, I so okay. I, I can take the vital access users thing to begin with. I think that one is, um, there's a, a really clear uh, and easy explanation for that, which is during the UVM cyber attack, they provisioned a very large number of user accounts in order to um, meet, you know, in order to have data to information about the patients they were seeing to support care. Um, appropriately, they then um, removed access for most of those users um, so that because they, they didn't need it um, after the cyber attack. We do go through an annual audit process with the um, organizations that use this and say, um, okay, here's here are all your users. Who do you want to remove? Um, and so UVM did took advantage of that appropriately. Like Any thoughts on the, the access users divided by potential users? Is that is sure. that what you would expect? I mean, I'm just I'm sort of is there a target goal for what that might be? I'm just kind of curious. It's diff it's it's the first time I've seen it laid out like that. Um, so it struck me. I just want to give a piece of context on that. So that is those are the out so everyone understands that those are reported differently from the way we report. And we can absolutely talk about how to get how to get this in our package. Those are the outcomes based certification metrics that we as a state are providing to um, CMS under the new um, certification program that you heard us, you've heard us talk about in the past under which the HIE was certified in May. Um, so that's some very specific numbers and I know Kristen may talk about these later, so I don't wanna steal her thunder either. Um, those are really relevant, relevant to the Medicaid provider population. I'm really, you know, making a, a tell, uh, making a presentation to CMS for Medicaid providers, the services being provided or being offered to them and, and usage there. Um, so I just want to explain a little bit about why those numbers might look a little different too about some of the stuff that we are presenting. Um, we can absolutely talk about putting these. I think, um, Kristen, we can figure out a way to make sure that these are going with our regular packets to the board. I want to be careful because these are, this is data that the state calculates and presents to CMS. So I want to make, um, we'll work out a process to make sure we get the accurate and current data available. Um, but to the question of, are they the numbers we would hope to see? I mean, I think we always want to see more usage, right? And But we also know that for a provider portal perspective, um, Providers don't all want to go into another yet another platform, right, and log in. And so that's why you see our, our kind of focus for going forward is both looking at the provider portal and expanding that because we do have providers that don't have robust EHRs. They don't have EHRs that they can get other data sources into. So they will want to use this that, that provider portal. But really where we want to put some new focus on is how do we get the HIE data into or accessible through their EHRs so they don't have to log into another system. And that's an area where we want to focus. So I do want to I mean, we always want more people to use the portal. I will absolutely say that, you know, to know that it's there and have access to it. But I don't want, I don't, I think it'd be short-sighted of us to think that is the solution. And I think we need to think about what that use will be holistically too and how we balance that out. Great. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, And so, so if I understand it, then that denominator is Medicaid providers. If this is Medicaid specific data, that's probably the denominator is is Medicaid providers yes. versus all potential. Okay, yeah. and and from your uh, perspective, getting the number of um, practices would be hard to figure out. You know, a, a a different denominator, say for the other populations, other payer populations that might. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. And I get, my last question actually is. Um, we often hear, and I heard it through the wait times investigation focus groups, and I hear it from providers, largely primary care providers, um, expressing frustration that they don't 
uh, get consult notes often back from specialists that sometimes it gets lost and, you know, it doesn't get faxed from the specialist's office back to the provider's office or it doesn't get integrated into their EHR. And um, it just strikes me that it should, I'm, I'm guessing, right, or I guess is what I would love to know is how do those consult notes show up in the VHI? Um, and, and is that a place where I could be answering, you know, I, I, I get emails sometimes, um, and I get comments about that frustration and is it, would it be fair to direct people to the VHI and say the consult notes should all be in there or what percentage of the consult notes should be in there or what, what, um, you know, is, is that a place, a source of that data that's being underutilized and, and, and primary care providers are waiting for the faxes, but actually should be you know, relying more on the VHI for those consult notes. Help me. I just don't know. I don't know enough to, to know whether it's there or not there or, you know, to be saying, hey, have you looked in the VHI <laughs> when people talk about it? Maureen, did you come off of mute because you wanted to answer that? Sure. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely available to answer that. No. I think, have you tried looking in the VHI is a great um, question. Have you tried looking in Vital Access? And we are certainly available to help people navigate that um, to provide some education. There are a couple places that could show up we, in the transcribed reports that we receive in the continuity of care documents we receive. I think there's always some potential work to be done um, to, to improve sort of the through rate there. Um, so if they go in and they don't find it, that's good data for us as well, um, because then we can help look at, at making sure that connection is delivering all of the data, including the consult notes, but absolutely uh, encourage them to try, please. So vital access should be a source potentially for many of these primary care providers to be yes. um, getting that. Okay, wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the presentation. There? If you that? know that it's if you know that it's from specific locations that mm -hmm. are common commonly that they're not finding it, it's certainly some converse, like something we can explore too. So I don't know if you see themes, like please don't hesitate to share with us who whose data might not be available that we can try to work with. Yeah. Okay. I will I'll think about that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um Dr. Merman, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, this is a. Uh... This is a, a great conversation. Um, I it's interesting because I feel like I'm learning a lot about something I didn't know about. But as a provider in the state, I feel like I should know about uh, Vital more. But as the conversation's gone on, it makes sense to me that as a hospital-based provider, that I probably don't have the opportunity or need to to use the services as much as as I, I think um, might actually make sense to use them. So I guess my first sort of comment is an anecdote relating to to member Holmes's comments and questions regarding uh, the numbers of individual providers accessing the data and uh, just you know conversations with colleagues over the last week or two of, of people realizing that nobody not nobody very few actually have have accessed uh, vital access and most of the ones who I spoke with actually were UVM folks during the cyber attack um, and I do think that actually, I, I work at Central Vermont Medical Center. That you know we are, uh, we are probably over reliant on Epic, but and the Care Everywhere component of that. But but we do take care of patients that receive care at multiple different hospitals and multiple different clinics and primary care providers that are not associated with, with the UVM Health Network. So I think actually utilizing Vital. Um, more and I actually, if you can figure out that integration into our EHR, you know, as you mentioned, logging into multiple different platforms at the same time is it's more irritating than it is onerous, to be honest. But uh, but it doesn't it 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 really decreases the likelihood that someone's going to access that data. So I I think if there could be a plug to encourage you to pursue that 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 the that's, I guess that's the point of this comment, but also it, it is kind of maybe not surprising to me, but it seems like there could be a lot more utilization of this um, by hospital-based providers, especially in hospitals where you, you're taking care of patients that are uh, transferred in um, from nearby hospitals or received care nearby. And all, all across the straight state, there's examples of that. Um, 
the other thing that I'm struck by that I'd like to just hear a little bit more on is the potential overlap between the goals of One Care and the goals of Vital and some of what Member Walsh's comments are regarding um, getting performance metric data back to providers about um, aspects of their patient's care, A1Cs, hypertension goals. It sounds like that is probable and likely to be able to be done through vital access if it's not already being done. But it, it seems that the data that you guys have and is more clinically relevant and less claims based, and that might actually provide more timely data to providers um, to, to do these quality improvement goals that we would have in the state. So could, could you sort of comment on the likelihood of that occurring? And, and, um, and if it is occurring, more about that too. Thanks. Sure. So um, again, I will let my team um, chime in um, where they where they have uh, anything to add. So we do actually work with One Care, and they you they do receive data from us to help inform some of their work. So we do not do the analytics. At, um, you know, we try to make the data, the raw data, uh, raw data is not fair, I'm sorry. We do a lot of work as you've heard to kind of clean up and match and standardize the data to make it usable for these purposes and do make it available for one care to use in their platforms to do some of their work. I think the challenge that we, we have in the state is not every patient is under a one care program, right? And we have many, many providers who um, have data from one care for some of their patients, but not all of their patients. And how do we make sure that that data, there's kind of um, data available across the board. So we are not looking to recreate what OneCare does, um, but rather um, think about ways that we can make sure all providers have access to the information they need for all of their patients and not just their OneCare patients. And some of that, you know, could be working with OneCare on some of these. Um, some of it will be making some basic um, data views and analytics available for those providers who either uh, who don't work with OneCare, who have patients not covered under OneCare. So we, I think it's um, an area that we definitely try to focus that so we're not trying to duplicate efforts that are that exist in the state, but also making sure that there is a bit of kind of equity and availability of the capabilities and the analytics for providers who might not have access to it otherwise. So do you provide that basic level data now to providers? We we don't. So the providers have access to the portal um, and the results delivery and kind of more at the clinical point of care. We don't have ways that the providers get that data from us now otherwise. And that's what we are going to be exploring with the state over the next year, year and a half about how, what are some basic dashboards and information that we might be able to make available to help inform patient care. And could you provide those dashboards to uh, providers, one care patients in addition to their non one care patients? Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I should say the, the HIE steering committee that I've talked about a couple of times that I know Kristen will be talking about later, um, does one care is our participant in that work. So as we think about the work we're going to do in the future as the HIE and, and to meet these needs, one care is part of those conversations. So we do have the opportunity to really explore what they might do, where we can partner together, where we can um, make sure we're not completely recreating or conf causing confusion in the work and the data we provide. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I'll turn it over to the HCA for any questions or comments. Nothing from us. Thank you. Great. Uh, and is there any public uh, comment? Please, again, use the raise your hand function if there is. OK. Um, it's 12.05, um, and so we'll take a break till 1 o'clock, and at 1 o'clock we'll hear the 2022 Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and Connectivity Criteria for 2023. So we'll see everyone back at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>